So now we're continuing our discussion and presentation of cannabis reforms and cannabis politics from a different angle. We'll go and see and have a little bit of a journey through socio-economical questions. So we've seen this morning on the first panel that cannabis policy change might have, might bring some promises to provide solutions for the environment, but that might also somehow form a threat as in depending on how cultivation are made or depending on other factors. So of course, the way we do farm our agricultural products do have an impact on the environment. Another question which is a bit left about within all those discussion about how cannabis policies are evolving is the socio-economical impact or the socio-economical transformations that the change in policy, changes in regulation could bring, not only for the planet, but also for societies and for our economies. We are living in this whole world, and of course, we have the environment, we have the people, and we have the society. Society being the network of the people, and how do we do live together? Not to make too much of a history, but we all know that those cannabis reform movements were also based on strong promises. Freedom for the people, freedom to use this mighty plant, special plant, particular plant, this cannabis plant, but also freedom as regards to what can those individuals can do with their body and with their minds and everything. So there's been all those changes. I don't want to recall also all the, um, the, um, the issues that prohibition brought as regards as incarcerations, discriminations, and loss of capacity to live, because when you get incar incarcerated, you got a criminal record, and it might be difficult for you to get a job afterwards. So of course, these prohibitions entails some very strong factors of discriminations afterwards. So let's go back to our main panel now. Having set up a bit of this, how the hopes that this policy change can bring to societies, we're gonna make this little journey. First, we're gonna have um, presentations of how the, um, some traditionally, but it's gonna be discussed, producing countries have been involved through those last 10 years. Kenza Afshai, she's a French sociologist, she has this unique perspective as a society researcher, and she has this ho holistic perspective on cannabis, the people who use them, the usage, the lands, and the environment. Then we'll have this presentation by Jonathan Newman, who's been searching a bit how this policy movements evolve and how does some question as we go to ethics, business, how this um, these, those issues are translated within the transformation. That's going to be like a bit of a broadcast of what's happening those last 10 years. And then we'll have those presentations of Robert Hoban from the New United States, as well as from Patty Amiguet, who is going to show us what type of concrete regulation we can set in place and what type of uh, business and organizations we can bring and see that those different models do bring different effects on societies. And then we'll have a round table with representatives of different companies, partners, and sponsors who have all developed their own approaches on how to organize those cannabis markets, cannabis business, etc. Please, Kenza, you may. Bonjour. <rire> Ça va bien. Euh, je suis sociologue économiste à l'Université de Bordeaux et je travaille sur le cannabis depuis de longues années, puisque j'y ai consacré mon master, mon doctorat, mon postdoc. Je suis toujours cannabis. 
And I, during all those years, I studied lots of uh, topics related to cannabis and its development, its economy, the participation of women and men in that economy, especially in the Rif in Morocco. And today I talk about the change and what's at stake regarding the cultivation of cannabis in Morocco and in Morocco and in the southern countries. I know generally in the world of cannabis. There are some traditional countries where the plant developed uh, during centuries in harmony with the other plants, with humans, and it's part of the genetic, uh, cultural, uh, social heritage, and it's even a, a part of the identity of the local people. In these countries where cannabis was introduced uh, uh, during centuries, uh, uh, adapted the, 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 the way they cultivated cannabis, uh, Uh, following the strong demand from the Western countries starting in the 60s, 1960s, and they m changed the product. And at the same time, there have been very little done. I mean, uh, with regard to research in southern countries like Morocco, Brazil, Lebanon, and, and only in the last few years, uh, we have seen some researchers from the south who, has been, who have been looking at that. Although there has been something done at the international level, but it is a, a, a recent trend. You have people from the South who are looking on the situation with cannabis in the South. And among those uh, traditional producing countries, you have Morocco, where uh, cannabis has been cultivated in the mountains of the Rif, in northern Morocco, and uh, they cultivate uh, hashish, which is... Um, sold nationally or internationally. And Morocco cultivated this because it was easy to export to Europe. And there are hundreds of thousands of jobs that are created, people working in the cultivation, then sellers and everything. And, and women are very much involved in the cultivation of cannabis with regard to, to farming, to production. Between the 1960s and the year 2000, the, the market was especially an export market towards uh, industrialist countries, uh, Europe, uh, North America, Australia, and you had uh, some small-scale farming, and uh, there were some uh, lab spaces For instance, in the Netherlands, the, the, you have lots of technology that is being distributed from there, as it was done also in California in the United States. Uh, today, in industrialized countries, the trend uh, uh, can now no longer be turned back. The usage of cannabis is uh, well spread, and uh, it's something that is debated publicly. But at the same time, the research in the university world Follow the same trend, since people have been working on it in Northern America, in England, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. And it's important because uh, scientists today are also part of this cannabis world. And you have uh, legal and illegal actors, uh, transnational, uh, which emerged since the 1960s between... Uh, industrialist countries and developing countries, especially since around 2000. You had the hippies in the 1960s, then you had the consumers who sometimes go to the southern countries, and you have also the, the, the breeders, the people who create new varieties. And you can notice the changes in the production techniques and transformation techniques, and this is due to the introduction of hybrid varieties of cannabis in the Rif in Morocco. And starting in 2000, the local variety of kif, that's how you call it, cannabis in Morocco, and it's been cultivated for thousands of years, and it was replaced by new hybrids. And hashish farmers have noted that with those hybrids, you have much better yield than with the local varieties, sometimes two or three times more. And the psychotropic effects of the hashish are much more potent than with the traditional hashish that was farmed in, in Morocco. The cost of production changed also. The, the, the price of a, for a kilo of seeds is 
between 200 and 400 euros, whereas uh, in the past, uh, seats were free and uh, were just exchanged between farmers. And farmers also uh, say that the hybrids necessitate much more attention, much more manpower, and uh, lots of water, and lots of pesticides. In several regions of the world, you have farmers who are still uh, are very much dependent on, the, on cannabis farming. Uh, there has been an increase in the country in Brazil, in Lebanon, in various countries. But you have whole economy that depend on the farming of cannabis. And competition has also increased. Um, people from Morocco had to adjust the product to the market. And the traditional cultures are completely changed because of the circulation of uh, people, of plants, of uh, seeds. Uh, and uh, the current cannabis market uh, uh, comes up with l few economic models that will be uh, favorable to more equity or justice. And you have uh, very much is at stake, uh, societally speaking or economically speaking. And you have also a, a problem, problems related to the environment, to the access to water and the land uh, problems. And you have more and more violence, especially because of the use of water. Since uh, with the hybrid varieties, you need uh, lots of uh, phytosanitary products and water. And therefore, farmers have to look for water up to 100 meters under the land surface, and that's very expensive. And you have more and more conflicts uh, that uh, are developing between small and large producers. And there have been even some murders recently, whereas it used to be a farming model that was characterized by nonviolence. And regarding cannabis also, and regarding all the inequality that are now uh, seen between uh, northern and southern countries, uh, you, you, there will be a hierarchy that will be created between patients for the medical medicinal use of uh, um, cannabis, and there are chances that uh, the people who will be um, treated in a less favorable manner will most probably be in the southern countries. And I think we have to show some collective imagination so that the solution that will be related to the cannabis won't be just following the new competitivity in, uh, as you can see in the rest of the economy. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start uh, talking about species and end up talking about policy and policy proposals, sort of a, a large evolution, if you like. And I'm going to do it in uh, one minute chunks, 12 one minute chunks, uh, possibly with some silences. So we'll see. So uh, let's restart. So I'll start with the species. Man, I'm trying to get my timer to work. That's it. I'll start with the species. Uh, I know you think you're all here as some sort of uh, people dressed up in your clothes with your documents and all your words and your numbers, uh, but uh, you're, you're really just species. I mean, we're just, we're just sort of matter and energy, organic things. We're, we're nothing that uh, wonderful spinning around on a planet. Uh, and if you don't believe me, which some of you might be unconvinced, you might think you're better than that, uh, just in the lunch break, uh, sit there, watch, watch what the effects of gravity are on each other, see how you cope with gravity, and, and watch yourselves eating, watch the food going in the mouth, you'll be left seeing what it is. And somewhere in there, there's an electrochemical jelly, sort of governing it all, some sort of a jellyfish, a medusa, stretching out through your body, trying to grasp the world, trying to see who you are, where you are, when you are, and are you one part or are you many parts? Uh, 
There goes the timer. Didn't know it did that. That's fun. Um, and as I try and understand other people, I grab bits of them. I grab something of them, but I can never grab them. I take something in, but it's not them. No, it's not them. And somewhere in there, I develop my ethics, the rights and the wrongs. So, that's section one. Section two, if I can get this thing to work. I'm really sorry, it's not working. Uh, right. So, here is the development goals from uh, the UN. And they're a terror. It's, it's idealism in the face of terror. And here's the terror. Billions of our citizens continue to live in poverty. Billions. There's only seven billion on the planet. But at least two billion of those are living in poverty. But does it matter? They're not here, they're somewhere else. There's a distance, and distance makes things almost disappear. There's rising inequalities within and among countries. There's disparities, differences of opportunity, wealth, and power. There's gender inequality. There's unemployment, youth unemployment, health threats, spiraling global health threats, spiraling conflict, violence extremism, terrorism, humanitarian crisis, the forced displacement of people. There's natural resource depletion. There's environmental degradation, land degradation, freshwater scarcity, loss of biodiversity, climate change. The survival of many societies, what? there we go again, the survival of many societies and biological support systems of the planet are at risks. That's what we're doing. That's what the, the chemical jelly amongst us all, that's what we're doing. That's who we are. That's how we are doing things now. So what are ethics? What are ethics? Are they, are they about being good? A little bit of kindness? Being less of a shark in a sea of sharks? Or are they about being bad now for some future good? How are we doing the right thing? Are, are the daily ethics of the individual the same as that of a company or government institution? Because a company or government institution is constituted by ethical individuals. But are they the same? And are these ethics somehow universal or, and eternal? Or do they emerge as we tell stories of the world, the Medusa somewhere in us, telling us stories of this world we're grabbing onto in a strange way? And in there, there is a tension between the realisms of where we are, or our imagination of those realisms, and the imagination of where we'd like to be. That's the ethical battle. And I can't get the timer to continue. Oh no, it was a free timer and now the account's run out. Okay, let's just go off the watch. When a minute's up, give me a shout. So much for free software. Um, so what do I research? I research cannabis, coffee, and arms. Those markets, the weapons markets, coffee markets. And so I sort of look at the junction between uh, regulation, technology, day-to-day -day business, and moral economy. But I also listen to plants. There's some plants there. Can I hear them? They're the only plants in the room. Well, there's some funguses around, I guess. Uh, but. Uh, I don't talk to plants. I don't listen to them like the old anthropologists who would measure the head and take the blood samples. I'm trying to see the way they see the world. And I'm also trying to understand how the Medusa up here managed to do all of this. It's the question I put to the arms industry. How did you manage to do this? Just this little floating thing. And you've produced a global, a global conflict industry. Have you developed lives and relationships with plants? And are you listening to them? Because when you listen to them, it's very silent. They don't use words and they don't use numbers. And they don't use science. They talk something else. So here we are, activists with different backgrounds and ways of organizing. Business people, political people, medical people, legal people, consuming people. And of course, we wear more than one hat. We're several of those. And everyone must have different positions and different ethics and different stories. And 
Ethics is quite complicated. How are they influenced? And when it comes to politics and business, where's, where's what you do? How do those come together? How do your politics and your business and your economy come together? The daily practice you do. And everyone here has a relationship with plants. You all do. But what's your relationship? Are you controllers? Are you colonizers? Where's the power relationship between you and the plant? There's an ethic there. In the United Nations yesterday, 62 years, talking world drug problems, world drug problems, world drug problems. And then, because that wasn't going to last very long, world drug problems beyond 2019. Let's, uh, let's just keep going for a while. Creating a story. And in a sense, for all its grandeur, it's not that grand. The setting's grand, the reputation, the United Nations, that's grand. But in a, it's a meeting like a village council. It's saturated with years of thinking, ways of discussion, and the art of politics. It's like a family coming together at Christmas. And the older issues are harder to settle. There's just too much history. Far easier to deal with a new substance coming in than the old one you've discussed for so long. How does it feel like to have a UN career? There's an ethic in there. Those people have position. What's doing the right thing at the CND? And how do we see it? We follow the cannabis thing, don't we? So we follow all the innovation, all the market hype, where science research is as much about marketing and marketing is as much about science research. And it all mobilizes. And increasing internet content. One minute, I've had 12 minutes. No, 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 go away. Duff. No, 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 no. Uh, there's internet content production. And of course, we're talking North America, Europe, and South America. Forget the Russians, forget the Chinese, forget their histories and governmentalities. Oh, they just don't understand. And what about Africa? Well, Africa's a big place. And everyone talks Africa. It's an enormous place. Lots of different things going on. And the money is driving the debate now. We've gone from a resistant lifestyle activism, and now we're in commodity activism. Commodity activism, that's what's happening now. And from there, we move on to industry governmental alliance. Cannabis is changing, it's fitting the dominant economic models, which, by the way, have brought you uh, billions in poverty and global change. That's what's going on. We're joining the club. And what do we talk now? I'll prove it. Regulation, innovation, medicalization, monetarization. That's the new politics of cannabis. Do we talk about the environment, degradation of natural resources, packaging, transport? Only here. It's the first time I've heard it. Labor conditions, work conditions, gender, poverty, inequality, energy use, promoting peace, food security. The majority of the cannabis industry has no interest in it. The UN is way ahead of the cannabis industry. And anyone can market ethics. The coffee industry has made an industry of marketing ethics, which once you get to the balloon and puncture it, of course falls apart. The arms industry, market ethics, they make the world a safer place. And business has this gravitational ethic that it's gonna create numbers in a limited space. But cannabis doesn't have to do that, because of course, it's got the commoditized cure-all. It's going to provide healthy lives of daily use, regardless of the impacts elsewhere. So I finally come down to the point of policy. The UN could regulate cannabis in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. It could say, if you fulfill these goals to the highest standards, you can have your cannabis. But it's not going to do that. And the cannabis industry could lead ethical innovation. It could be world leaders in pushing these goals to levels unseen. But it's not going to do that either. And if you want to know the ethics of what's going on between policy and the industry, it's why they're not going to do that. Why they're not going to fulfill the goals is the ethics of what is going on now. Listen to the plants. That's it.
Thank, thank you very much for those two presentations, inviting us for a bit of rec reflexivity and maybe a bit of consciousness in our actions. And now we're going to pursue our journey with two concrete um, presentations of concrete models of regulations. Maybe we'll begin with uh, the United States. Rob Urban, you may. What happens when a movement becomes an industry? Let me say that again. What happens when a movement becomes an industry? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. That's the question that you need to get an answer to before you leave Vienna tomorrow, because that's the most important question that needs to be answered. That is the solution to a lot of the policy changes that are happening around the world. For so long, we've seen the motivation move forward on what's right and wrong. And that still needs to govern and shepherd the process. But you have to understand that this is a very, very large industry right now, worldwide. And it spares no expense in many regards. And it's our job to bring the industry to this room, to this organization, to the United Nations. Many of you know me as an attorney, but I've taught cannabis policy at the University of Denver since 2011. And as a result of that, I've been fortunate enough to travel around the world. I've crafted legislation and regulations for over two dozen countries in cannabis, marijuana, and hemp. That puts me in a particularly unique situation, I believe, to be sensitive to the cultural differences, the scientific differences, the political differences, but also, what's the reason that each country individually decides to legalize cannabis or to regulate cannabis? They're all very, very different. We've seen this in the United States, state by state by state. The reasons are always very different. So what happens when a movement becomes an industry? Is there precedent for this? Are there lessons we can learn from other industries? When I've asked that question, in fact, last night over a cocktail, the response was, you know what, Bob, the answer is, look at the recycling industry. What? The recycling industry? That doesn't make sense to me. What do you mean by the recycling industry? What they said was, they said, well, people that moved to have cities across the US and countries uh, enact policies that mandated certain recycling requirements of plastic bottles, et cetera. What happened to the folks that pushed so hard for that policy? Do those folks, those activists, those people that led the movement, do they have a role in the garbage industry or the recycled industry, that, that, that element of that industry? And the answer is unclear, but it's certainly not a definitive yes. And that's what I think we need to understand here, is how we can create a sustainable program that incorporates folks that have worked so hard, but also recognizing that the business interests are here today. And that's perhaps a unique US-based perspective, but that's what's leading the way. So one of the things I wanted to talk about this morning, just to give you an, an accurate, perhaps, presentation of where we are in the US. And I think it's important to understand what's happening in the US as a baseline, not because it's the, it's the system that we think is best. It's the system that's working, and it's the system that we believe is going to take hold, um, at least in many places that follow the US's lead. And the US system is very, very different than, for example, the Canadian system. The US system is a function of practicality, meaning when you pour water somewhere, the water takes the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance from a policy, a policy perspective in the US is threefold. There are three distinct lanes, if you will. The first road, the first lane, over-the-counter marijuana. You may say, why are you just dividing this into three different lanes? This is cannabis. We should have cannabis policy, and we should be able to dictate the uses from the plant. Well, in the United States, that's not likely to happen absent federal leadership. And we don't have tremendous federal leadership, nor do I believe we'll have national leadership on this issue at the political level in the United States as a cannabis policy measure. 
But if you look at these three lanes that I'm about to describe, I think you'll understand. And this is what I think you need to get your heads around. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means this is the way it's going to develop in the U.S. The first lane, going back, here's road number one, over-the-counter marijuana. That's what we have in our so-called dispensary system, okay? State by state, the marijuana does not cross state lines. It's regulated very tightly at the state level. Some states have preconditions where you have to show a medical reference. Some states simply say if you're above a certain age, you can purchase cannabis. But it's all over-the-counter marijuana, okay? That's lane number one. And I don't believe that that's going to change anytime soon. I think you'll see federal reform, but I still think for the foreseeable future that marijuana will be grown, cultivated, distributed within states, intrastate, no interstate commerce. Okay, that's lane number one. Lane number two, what's lane number two? Lane number two is what I call the nutraceutical lane. It applies most specifically to hemp. Lane number two is foods and supplements. Okay, And we've got a great example in the U.S. of how this can evolve. Because we have a, a very, very strong supplement industry in the United States. And the laws in the United States make supplements a thing that's very different from medicine and very different from this over-the-counter marijuana scenario. So supplements and foods regulated by a standard at the federal level, which already exists, and that's what we're about to see really move into the limelight, move forward very quickly when we see the new, new farm bill pass. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. The third lane, what's the third lane? This is the lane that oftentimes we don't like to talk about because it scares us. The word pharma, big pharma even, bigger pharma, it scares us. That's the third lane. That's cannabis-based medicine. All three of those lanes will exist at the same time. They're distinct. They'll exist in that way for the foreseeable future. And the cannabis-based medicine lane requires a company to spend an enormous amount of money to prove a specific formula, treats a specific condition, and get that approved by the FDA. So there are three distinct segments of the industry. Why would I suggest that you think of it this way? Because that's the way it is right now, and that's the way it appears it's going to be for the foreseeable future. Are we going to have a president like the, 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 the great prime minister from Canada who stepped up and said, we're going to make this a, a, a national program across the board? We may, but I don't see that happening in the short term. And so you have these lanes. Water is going to flow very easily into these distinct policy lanes. So with that as a backdrop, let me just comment for a moment about the status of law in the United States. Everybody talks about cannabis policy, but in the United States, there's cannabis. We all know cannabis is the plant species, but there's really two segments of the cannabis industry. There's the hemp segment, and there's the marijuana segment. What's the difference between hemp and marijuana? Legally speaking, as most of us know, in the United States, it's that 0.3% threshold, THC standard, okay? That's the standard. And that's the way that you would distinguish between those distinct policy lanes. Whether that's a sustainable standard, the 0.3%, I know it's lower in many parts of the world, including here in the EU. Should it be 1%? There's other countries that are, that are experimenting with that as a policy. Certainly from a market perspective, if I'm a farmer, I'd rather grow 1% plants than 0.2% plants because I can yield more cannabinoids, which is currently the primary driver in the industry. So if I look at the policies, the, the state of the law in the US, the federal government in 2014 said you can grow hemp, but the question that was never answered was, what do you do with that hemp? I don't think federal legislators, I don't think state legislators who enacted state programs ever understood that the major reason to grow hemp right now, particularly in the U.S. to meet the consumer demand, is for CBD or cannabinoid extracts. They didn't understand that necessarily. So they certainly didn't say, hey, you can grow this hemp 
And FDA, you should regulate these products. They never said that. And to that point, the FDA has never stepped up and said, here's how we're going to do this. Although those, those clients of my law firms, those good companies in this room that operate in the US, they voluntarily follow those FDA standards, whether it's something, for those of you that don't know the, the acronym for American law under the supplement category called the Deshaies Act. It's the Dietary Supplements Act effectively. Those standards apply. So you voluntarily follow those standards and you can um, safely assume that states in which you sell those products will be compliant with their standards if they allow it. But the new, new farm bill that's going to pass allegedly very, very soon, uh, there was a deal struck between the Senate and the House on both of our sides of Congress where they sort of uh, harmonized provisions within this farm bill. And the farm bill, by the way, is something that passes every five years. It's not hemp or cannabis specific. It wasn't until 2014 that hemp made its way into this legislation. So this new farm bill, the new new farm bill will make it absolutely clear that hemp is not a controlled substance with no restrictions. That's a significant shift in US cannabis policy. And we have to give these politicians credit. And in fact, this leadership on this issue comes from the, the weirdest sources you would imagine if you follow American politics from afar. It comes from the Republican side. The Republicans are leading the charge with industrial hemp. Why? Because there's a rich history of hemp cultivation Pursuant to some of the data we've heard earlier about how much of a cash crop hemp was around the world, it was the number one cash crop in Kentucky, a very, very Republican conservative state for a long, long time. And those senators are pushing it. So we'll have some clarity very, very soon at the federal level with regard to that. Because right now, while it's legal, there's an argument to be made. It's not enforced, but there's an argument to be made that that industry should be narrow. It should be for research of the market, not to create an unfettered market. Congress and politicians that pass this legislation say that there's no limitations on it. But again, who wants to be that company that ends up in a courtroom trying to debate that issue uh, uh, when their life is on the line? So the new new farm bill will solve a lot of the problems and give us great clarity on the hemp side. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, the exact same cannabinoids that exist in marijuana are also in hemp. So if hemp is a federally legal product, now specifically regulated by the FDA with the new, new farm bill, why would a company like GW Pharma produce its products from marijuana with all of that regulatory oversight handling what's unequivocally a Schedule I substance? Why wouldn't it do it with hemp? Well, that's what's going to change. And you're going to see the marijuana side of the industry be, remain fairly narrow. I don't want to compare it to the liquor industry, but for marijuana, people can use marijuana for their own purposes, but they don't necessarily have to identify what those purposes are. Much like if you were to self-medicate with alcohol, for example. And then the research and the designs are going to come from the hemp plant, just because our laws are more favorable there. So, with that said, I want to bring this to a head. I do want to suggest something that is, is a concept that when I talk to people, a lot of people I don't think understand. I don't dispute the science behind medical marijuana, not even for a second. We all know what the endocannabinoid system does. We know what cannabinoids can do when introduced to the body. There's studies all over the world that suggest this. But in the United States, the debate has shifted beyond the science, or not perhaps beyond, the science debate's sort of put to the side right now. You know what medical marijuana means in the United States right now? It means safe, quality, consistent access to product. That's all it means. And if you can have safe, quality, consistent access to the product, then you can experiment on yourself, your son, your daughter, your family member, and that's the, the, the first way to open that door. It's not a perfect system, but it is the framework against which we operate. So, those are some things I'd want you to think about, but please help me find the answer to this question. What happens when a movement becomes an industry? Because that's exactly, exactly where we're at right now. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for those uh, very uh, critical reflections. Now we'll have Patty Amiga. 
She's one of the leaders in another way to provide access to cannabis, a way which is a non-profit way, which is the Cannabis Social Club way of organizing the... Good morning. Uh, well, my, my name is Patricia Miguel. Um, I come from Spain, from Barcelona. Uh, I represent the organized civil society. I come from, I'm the president of CATFAC, the federation. I'm the president of CATFAC, the Cannabis, uh, federation, of, uh, Cannabis uh, federation of Associations in Catalonia. But I'm the spokeswoman today of CONFAC. Uh, CONFAC is the agrupation of many federations all around Spain. I don't know if you know how it works in Spain, but we have like uh, communities, and each community has more or less its federation. Each federation looks after the political issue on cannabis in, in, this, in the area, and CONFAC looks after the politic of cannabis in the whole state. No? Um, the thing is like... Uh, Nowadays, uh, what we can do in the communities is very little, and what we have to do is to change laws in the Spanish state, in the, in the state. Um, so, uh, I'm coming here to speak about the Cannabis Social Club model. Uh, far away from the states, uh, we don't have a regulated model. We have a self-regulated model. Uh, civil society started this own model to find a solution uh, to prohibition. In, uh, in the year 67, Spain uh, legislature, in order to adapt to the convention signed in 61, started laws that punished uh, the crop and cultivation of cannabis. But it's not until 1992, when uh, coinciding with the Olympic Games and the Expo in Seville, when wanting to make a cleaning of the heroin problem in Spain, uh, we have this uh, citizen security law that it's approved, and it not only co punishes consumption and possession in the public areas, but it does also punish users for this the, the, the only way of, the only, mm, uh, the only status of users, I mean, uh, just to have cannabis or any drug in your pocket or just to have a consumption of cannabis or any other drug in the streets, you can be fined, okay? At that moment in 1992, uh, the fines were up to 300 euros. Uh, but nowadays, in 2015, we had a new law, uh, cit new citizen law uh, approved, and now it's gone up to 600 euros. Uh, I have this uh, little uh, extract uh, from the report on drugs of the Spanish state in 2017, and it says, in Spain, the vast majority of offenders are charged with administrative offenses for possession of drugs under the law of protection of cit citizen security, while only a minority of the complaints are constitutive of crime. Eight of out, eight out of ten cases are associated with cannabis, meaning like the users of cannabis are the most punished, punished in the Spanish state. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, a series of users decided to organize themselves to be able to consume in private sphere uh, of their homes or meeting points without having to access through alternative markets to the substance. Uh, throughout the decade of the 92,000, and thanks to these pioneers, uh, there's the beginning to lay the foundations of what we know today about the CCC model. Uh, these pioneers, uh, thanks to the judicial sentences uh, of, well, they crop, they cropped and they had police uh, going inside the crops, so at the end they had prosecutions, and the result of these prosecutions made a uh, 
like to have the chance to delimitate what it was wrong and it was okay of growing uh, cannabis in a in a in a collective way. Um, so these people also uh, in charge, uh, Juan Muñoz and Susana, and Susana Soto, they are criminalists from the univers university in Malaga. They did this in form. And what they did is like they figured the model of CCC inside the state legislation. So that's what we know, uh, our gray area. It's not that CCC model is legal, but it's in a gray area where it's not illegal, at least. It's illegal. Uh, in 2010, uh, the Federation of Association, of Cannabis Association, the one that you see the logo down here, that is the one before the compact, because at the beginning there were only associations that get together at the state level, but once it starts to grow the movement, it's when we need to make like the community movement. Uh, they get all the information of the sentences and they get the inform that these two guys did and they did the, uh, the it, it's called uh, the club guide, okay? So this club guide in 2010, it was published and it's what it really made that the movement or what we know today uh, known as the phenomenon of cannabis social clubs in Spain. It's when the information is opened and everyone can access to this information and they have this guide where they know what to do and how to start to perform a CCC. Uh, and that's also why today in 2018 we are speaking about the CCC model and the CCC ph phenomenon. Um, it's, I wanted to speak about these three images. The first one, ARSEC. It's the first association, it's not like a club, but it's the first uh, meeting of people that get together and they make a, a collective cultivation. Uh, police cut their plants, it was in 1991 or 1993, if I'm not confused. But they were the pioneers, the ones that started and the ones that made the, uh, the effort to uh, make this cultivation. And thanks to them, we are speaking about this today. FAC, as I told you, is the first federation of associations in Spain. And this image here is the statutes in, uh, to, in 1997, uh, the first statutes of the federation that they were signed for the, uh, thank, uh, with these activists, uh, that they were the ones that fight it uh, so that we can be here today. Um, many of you know like the story of association, so I don't want to go really on and on about this, but uh, I believe that it's important to understand that the associations, uh, had, the model of associations has made some achievements that it's important to remark. The first of one, the first of all, is that the associations are born from civil society. It's not a regulation from politics. It's people that get together, they get organized, and they push uh, for this model to not be uh, um, fight with the laws. It's a model of self-regulation in response to a lack of, of the states. Uh, second, it is, it's, it's initially born to avoid alternative markets in order to access a safe and quality substance. We will speak later on about the problems that this brings. Uh, third, it encourages the association and grouping among equals, and this promotes the destigmatization and socialization. Fourth, it has generated a certain normalization of cannabis in the state. It's a perception, uh, we have a perception that it's a soft drug. Uh, now, like maybe 10 years ago, you asked in Spain to any person that it wasn't like youth or that it was thought to use cannabis and they would uh, say that cannabis was the door to taking other drugs. Nowadays, uh, and thanks maybe to medical access and many notices that you find in the papers, uh, even my grandmother knows about cannabis and she's like more than happy to have her great, uh, great, son, great daughter speaking about this today. Um, the number five, uh, groups of patients have been born and they have organized to access uh, of their medicine. Many patients started getting to uh, associations uh, to get their medicine, 
But what happened, it's like uh, there are some associations that they are specialized in, uh, in cannabis medical users, but not all of them are. So many people went there to find what they thought it would be medicine, but it wasn't really medicine because it wasn't analyzed or it wasn't really what they needed. So uh, they got together, they organized, and now they are cropping what they really need for them. So it's like really special, and this is thanks to the associations as well. Um, number six, if associations d uh, didn't exist in the Spanish state, we wouldn't be talking about uh, regu integral regulation. Uh, we have the CCC model, but nowadays we have the discussion also on uh, having uh, an open market, or we are also trying to regulate the self-crop in our homes, no? So, or the medical use. So now we are discussing all this, and if it wasn't for the associations, this wouldn't be happening. Uh, Seven, they have generated an increase of knowledge and culture around the consumption of cannabis and derivates by the users. Uh, people know about varieties, people know about quality, about prices, uh, consumption ways. No, it, it means uh, like 20 years ago, uh, people would give you a bag of cannabis, it would have seeds, it wouldn't be nice, it wouldn't be cute, and now people look for quality, quality people look for uh, this train that they're looking for, or whatever. Uh, nine, uh, in 2018, we had this uh, research carried out by uh, a, a, um, an investigator from La Universidad Autónoma from Barcelona, and he estimated that uh, if cannabis was regulated, 101,569 jobs of quality would be generated in Spain. Uh, we also have the different thing that has happened with the model is like, um, they're like, uh, how you call it in English? You have like the, um, the people that, um, ¿cómo se llama? Patronal. Ah, the people that take ro uh, ro uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> the people that have the companies, no, the people that own the companies, uh, normally are not the ones that are looking after the workers. In this case, it's the other way. Uh, we associations have approached or we have gone to the syndicates and to see if we could create the cannabis sector. Uh, and look after the people that were working inside the associations because nowadays there's a lack of regulation. They don't have a specific regulation for the work that they are doing. Um, so we are looking for that. So it's also different of how it works. And in the same study, it is commended that the Spanish state would collect per year uh, through taxes and contributions 3 million, 3, 3, 312 millions of euros. 20% of that would come only from associations. I mean, like 10% will come from uh, self-crop, 20% from associations, and the rest would come from industrial, uh, more, commercial, more, com more commercial movement. Uh, the thing is like the only faults of the model that I find at the end always come uh, from a same uh, premise, no? The lack of regulation. If we had regulation, many of these things wouldn't happen, no? So uh, there's an, uh, an evolution of the initial model of CCC, that it was a political model, a, poli a model that wanted to change laws, no? Uh, the development of this one has come to more commercial pract praxis, no? that it wasn't what we thought it would be the associations at that beginning, but it's an evolution. Uh, this wouldn't have happened if we had a regulation and politicians said uh, how they want us to do things. If you don't tell us um, how we do the things, we will do it by ourselves, no? Um, access to the substance via alternative markets. Associations uh, are supposed to crop their own wheat, but the problem is that in Spain, if you crop wheat, uh, you will be punished if this weed is found. Uh, if you could go to jail uh, from one year to six years or more, depending on how much is the quantity that you crop. And also, uh, we have loads of theft 
Uh, and the thing is that you can't go to police and say that they have robbed your wheat. So what happens is that people at the end are not cropping their own wheat and they are going to alternative markets to get the wheat that we are serving in associations. So it's like really hypocrite or paradoxical, no? That if we had a regulation and we could cultivate our wheat, we could be serving a really good quality wheat in the associations. Uh, also, the cost to carry uh, and have 100% quality wheat as they have in the States is like it's very complicated because the, um, the, little, um, the little market uh, that we have, it's like really monopolized and expertise analy analysis from the, uh, from the wheat is like really, really expensive. So maybe for uh, uh, association with a large amount of members, it's easily, it's more easy to make on this expense and have more wheat of quality. But for many associations that maybe have 100, 120 members, it's not as easy to have this quality, this wheat of quality, because it's really expensive to achieve analysis or to have expertises getting to your camps and saying, okay, this is a good weed or whatever, no? So at the end, all, what, all the problems related to associations come from the lack of regulation. If we have the regulation, the model works. So two last conclusions. There are many, but we can speak afterwards. Uh, the first is that CCC model is a viable alternative in a hypothetical regulated market. It will promote the development of a social model based on in a cooperative and sustainable economy. The second one, while the cannabis review is kept on standby, society will always look for alternatives to safely access any substance. It is not anyone's objective to harm themselves, so it's common sense that we organize ourselves to suffer the least damage to health and our person in general. So thank you very much, and thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much for all these introductions, introductory words that were, I think kind of uh, frame uh, the discussion that we're going to have now. We're going to have this discussion with more concrete examples. When I arrived this morning in the train, I was kind of reflecting myself how I'm going to wrap up this discussion. And I, I get, began to remember when I was late teenagers, Listening to Bob Marley singing Legalize It, these type of things, it carry on this big hope for the people, hope of having a normal relationship with a plant that was, that is prohibited. So it was also an era where we have all those ideas that another world was possible. I construct some new ways to function as societies, as individuals, also within our working organizations. The legalization, in fact, is more as regard to the right of the people. Legal regulation is more the right of the companies, companies to commercialize different types of goods. Of course, norms and standards, what are they? They just regulate the products and trade, advantage for commerce. So with all these types of things in mind, I was thinking all those promises that the cannabis reform was having, and, and we, we all reflect and conceptualize on how Cannabis reform can solve many issues for the environment, for the relations between people, for the relation with discriminated people, for the relations with people who've been injured by the harms of prohibitions. And what's happening now? What's happening now? Things are happening in different ways. In these two days, we had three significant news. The CND doesn't want to take position, yeah, that's usual business, political life. Same, same, it's going to change. But two news, also very interesting, popped me. The first one, 
We all know this big company, Canopy. They bought Storz and Bickel. We all know Storz and Bickel. The vaporizers, first company, very well-known German company. So it's not only vertical integration, but it's also horizontal and taking all those type of ancillary systems. So this is a type of, of, of model, of course. Another news from yesterday, I think we all know Altria, these companies who fabricate and market Marlboro, they just bought 45% of Kronos, this Canadian company. Yeah, $1.8 billion. Thank you for the precision. <laughs> so they're going to have the majority soon. So all these types of models, it also reflects our relationship with um, organizational structures, managerial structures, and capitalism. So now we're going to have like three different insights of how do we deal with that. Michalis Theodoropoulos is Greek, and he's setting up cooperative around hanf, uh, sorry, hemp produce. He's going to explain us how we organize the relationship with the farmers. Manu Kadi, his uh, boss, or within the board of Ikurangi, um, a new New Zealand company. I think it's really happening now, which also are developing a really interesting model on how to integrate farmers that were um, cultivating marijuana illegally. How to integrate them within the legal system. And we'll have Jonathan Zaid from Aurora, Canada, who's going to explain us how we integrate social responsibility within the organization. Please, Michalis, you may take the floor. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Fat uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, I was asked to um, briefly argue, uh, let's say, on the revolutionary nature of cannabis and uh, the opportunities, the employment and the economic opportunities arising uh, in the industry. Uh, based on our experience uh, in Greece. Um, my background is on environmental policy and management. Uh, since 2005, I organized the Athens Cannabis Protestival, the annual Cannabis uh, Protestival, and uh, a campaign. Uh, I'm one of the main, uh, let's say, policy, cannabis policy advocates in the country since then. And uh, in 2016, uh, when we managed to regulate hemp, uh, we established a Cannabio Hemp Cooperative uh, with the purpose to, to produce uh, quality organic hemp uh, products, mainly uh, for food and uh, cosmetics. Uh, for the last uh, one year or so that we have seen change also in the medical cannabis uh, sector, uh, we have uh, taken up another, uh, let's say, hat, and we advise also uh, investors that uh, are pursuing uh, medical cannabis investments. Uh, uh, Cannabio uh, was formed initially uh, by um, utilizing uh, the, the Greek legislation and the, the legal uh, entity as a social uh, cooperative enterprise. There is a specific legal entity in the Greek law uh, that uh, basically uh, is something like a workers' cooperative that exists in other countries. And it has, it is uh, focused in uh, the democratic decision making among the members. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have uh, 18 members uh, from all over Greece. Uh, each one of us has uh, equal shares, has equal rights, and one vote in the General Assembly. Uh, I happen to be also the, the president of the executive board uh, of uh, the cooperative. And um, 
the idea was initially to 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 set up a, a cooperative company that uh, covers all aspects. It is vertically integrated, and uh, it's not only comprised of farmers, but also people that are involved in uh, processing, in, in uh, business development, in marketing, sales, uh, so as to be part of the, the whole uh, process uh, chain. Uh, our, uh, uh, our motive and our drive to get involved in, uh, as, as a cooperative in this industry uh, it was based on um, the actual characteristics of the cannabis plant that from the ancient years that was uh, produced in, in Greece and throughout the world, uh, it had a strong uh, community-based approach, uh, especially in Greece that was cultivated uh, mainly for fiber. The, the whole community was participating in the whole production process. And um, for us, it is a sustainable crop that uh, could revolutionize and could, could give a new impetus to the agricultural development in Greece. Uh, to the agricultural economy and uh, to give, to diversify, to give new opportunities to farmers uh, to get into a new market. Uh, also, uh, it provides us uh, with motives for uh, young people uh, to escape city centers and to get involved again with primary and tertiary production, to get involved with the land and uh, because for the last, uh, as you all know, for the last 10 uh, or so years, we have a um, quite harsh economic uh, reality in Greece and uh, people within the cities, and especially young people within the cities, they find it difficult to find employment opportunities and to, that have a, uh, for, a bright, for a more bright future. Uh, our, uh, with Cannabio, from the very beginning, our uh, approach was focused on sustainability, was focused on craft quality and the community-based approach. Uh, the, the, the legal entity model that we follow uh, basically uh, divides the profits of the company only among the workers, only among the people that work to bring this added value to the company. And uh, so far, out of the 18 members, we have managed to, uh, have, to have six or seven uh, paid positions. And uh, seasonally, we have employed more, more than 30 uh, unemployed youth from the region that uh, were established in Volos. And uh, we provide uh, opportunities for employment uh, both to non-skilled and uh, skilled workers. Uh, the, the, um, the farmers uh, are able to be either members uh, of the cooperative or to have a contract uh, farming relationship, uh, but we want to have, let's say, longer term uh, contracts so as to secure uh, a vi viability of the um, whole experiment. Uh, since, uh, just to give you an idea of how, uh, although we are in the very early stages of uh, industry development in, uh, in Greece, just to give you a rough idea on how this is already contributing to the employment uh, and economic prospects, <laughs> so quickly. Uh, in 2016, there were only four farmers. In 2017, the farmers became 15. And last year, we had more than 40 farmers involved in, in production. Uh, for the last 12 months, uh, there are more than 60 uh, hemp shops, dedicated hemp shops, that were, uh, let's say, established throughout the country, which means real economy uh, and money being circulated to the real economy, 60 families live out of distributing hemp products. Uh, very briefly, because I see there is not much time uh, to tell you that 
uh, we see with great respect uh, the work that's been done uh, by FAT for linking cannabis production and sustainable development. Um, with our work, what we want to, to, let's say, stress out is the, the, revo the revolutionary character of cannabis, which will allow us to move beyond sustainable development in terms that it is about time to, let's say, question the existing economic model that brings out uh, economic and uh, environmental destruction. And uh, with hemp and cannabis, we can uh, redefine uh, our uh, economic and development patterns and create a truly sustainable society, uh, self-sufficient. We are able to produce our own medicine. We are able to produce our own food, energy, our clothes. It is a revolutionary tool for us to be self-sufficient and to move beyond the business as usual scenario that has become sustainable development. Uh, we, are, we would like to, to speak the, with the officials and the politicians with their own language, but it is also a, a good uh, opportunity in time to question the, the very nature of this uh, economic system and to move beyond to truly uh, resilient and sustainable patterns. Thank you. Much, Thank you very much, Michelle. You may. Before I talk about the, the model that exists today, I, I want to go back five years. Um, at the time, I was really struggling with my health. I, I developed a condition called new daily persistent headache that caused 24-7 headaches, migraines, and insomnia. And I had tried uh, all the pharmaceutical options. I tried all the other treatments that were available on the market, just like so many other cannabis patients that we know. I was looking for a different option and, and one that worked. Um, and I finally found cannabis, and it did help. It was the first time I slept in five years, the first time I tried it. And from there, it really helped restore my quality of life. But five years ago in 2013 was a pivotal time in the Canadian market and Canadian policy. This was a time when the, trans, the regulations were transitioning from a largely home production uh, set of regulations to one of the birth of the Canadian global industry that we see today. But it was also a time when activists in Canada were doing a great job at what they have been doing for 20 years. We had already had a system for medical cannabis for 15 years or so, and one largely driven by courts and patient activism um, that was truly and meaningful um, at the time. But at the same time, I was a patient who was sitting at home struggling to access the medicine, the only one that helped me, with no insurance coverage and, and little access available as the regulations transitioned. And the activism community was doing a great job. And at the same time, they weren't necessarily transitioning into this new model where politicians for the first time and our regulators for the first time were willing to have conversations with patients and activists. So I, I see activism in a way as a continuum, as, as, as a continuum where activism and grassroots starts off has, starts the conversation, and as public policy um, and a public opinion more so shifts, there's something to be done and something to be said around switching a little bit more from activism to advocacy, and then from advocacy to partnership as regulation evolves. And by being a partner and by being an advocate, you can have an informed conversation and really influence policy, not alienate regulators, understand that this is a policy that they can win that they can win votes on, and that the public opinion now supports, and we're all focused on one thing, and that's patient access. So at the time, I founded uh, an organization called CF CFAM, a nonprofit patient advocacy group, to lobby on behalf of patients in Canada. And one of the key things as legalization for non-medical cannabis developed was that patients were protected in this, that they, their access to their medicine was protected. Um, and, and this was a really pivotal point. This was the birth of the industry that we see today. Since that time, a few years down the road, Canada now has one of the largest uh, regulated cannabis markets in the world. I'm with a company called Aurora Cannabis. We're a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. 
And I think that this transition to a, a regulated industry where we have publicly traded corporations uh, distributing and producing cannabis allows us to define this industry, uh, the regulated industry, with uh, hallmarks of sustainability and corporate citizenship right from the beginning. I lead our advocacy and CSR uh, portfolio, um, and we really take a, 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 a truly holistic lens when we look at CSR and corporate citizenship. It must become through the DNA of the company. Everything we do has to become uh, through the lens of corporate citizenship and sustainability. And as this conference was evolving and looking at the sustainability goals of the UN, it, it, it strikes me as the very last one is partnerships. And I think what we're doing here today is, is truly meaningful and needs to continue being done. The cannabis industry, patients, and everyone here, it, it shouldn't be siloed. We're all in this together. And companies like Aurora take the position that it should be an inclusive market. An inclusive market helps everyone. It creates a sustainable market and one that can truly create economic growth for all communities. And we know cannabis has marginalized so many communities around the world. We take uh, uh, this opportunity to also take a strong advocacy stance. Most mature industries, uh, publicly traded companies, can't take, and, or, or won't take rather, a, a very strong stance on social justice issues, for example, or public policy. No one's telling the cannabis industry that we can't do that. We are doing that. We are telling uh, the government that the right thing to do in Canada is to provide amnesty for personal possession offenses um, and other cannabis offenses moving into legalization, recognizing that prohibition has disproportionately affected marginalized communities. And even as legalization has evolved, those communities still are marginalized by prohibition and the effects of the previous criminalization. So with all of this said, I think that we're at a pivotal point where we can define this industry, uh, this community and sector as one around sustainability and really focus on partnership, work together in a collaborative way and, and build this industry that it, that's one right uh, from the get-go is responsible. And it's truly um, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity where a newly regulated industry is born where that can be done. So I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please. Sorry, I couldn't see you all, so hello. Um, my name's Manu Kedi. I'm from uh, one of those marginalised communities. We're right on the margins of the globe, really. We're sort of the first, or we're way down the bottom by Australia and, and our communities out on the very uh, rural uh, east coast of, of the North Island. Um, we're the first place in the world to see the sun every day and uh, I live in a village of about 800 people. It's about two hours drive. I was going to say to the next city, but it's a town in your terms. Most of, most of you, it's about 30,000 people. And, um, and I've come from a background of social justice and community organising and uh, now find myself the CEO of a cannabis company worth possibly 20 million, maybe 100 next year if we um, go public and uh, raise some more funds. Um, but we, we came at it from a job creation opportunity for our, our community. We've, since the 70s and 80s, had a strong Rastafarian community. Uh, we're known as the suppliers of good cannabis for most of New Zealand in, in the illicit uh, market. And um, many of those families have had fathers and, and brothers and uncles that have been taken to, to prison for, for cannabis. And uh, we have high unemployment and was looking for an opportunity to create some legitimate jobs and everybody could see the way that the world's going slowly um, towards decriminalisation and, and that that black market was going to dry up and, and so creating some legitimate jobs for some of our families. Um, and so we, we've progressed along. We got the first medical cannabis licence after growing hemp for two years under our industrial hemp regulations and uh, we're, we're moving quickly in, into uh, production at an industrial scale, uh, creating jobs and cultivation. And we've created courses through the local technical institute for people to come through who already know how to grow very well. And, um, but there's, there's so many other opportunities. And I, I totally agree, this is the, the one opportunity maybe in 100 years that a, a brand new global industry is being created. And we have such a good opportunity to um, 
lay the foundations of what could be a really ethical, uh, if, if, if it's not a contradiction in terms, an ethical industry. Um, that yeah, very few of these opportunities uh, have presented themselves uh, at, a, at a global scale. So, you know, we're, we're a small country, we're a small community, and we see ourselves not being able to compete with the auroras and those sort of things. And so we've started building connections across um, continents uh, with a focus on fair trade cannabis um, and, and trying to develop those standards. So being part of the ASTM um, ind uh, Industries Technical Standards Association, which is sort of a global, uh, there's a, a committee in there for cannabis and encourage all of you to, to join that if you're not already. Um, but not just technical standards in terms of how we analyse the cannabis and things, but labour standards and, and protecting the workers, and environmental standards uh, for the industry and so on. So uh, we've got partners now in, in Africa, um, Asia and uh, Europe, North America, and as an Indigenous community, we're reaching out to our Canadian Indigenous uh, cousins and, and looking at trade opportunities between First Nations and Aboriginals in, in uh, Australia. And it's, I think it's, again, it's a great opportunity to rebalance some of the injustice and, and uh, from historic uh, events and, and colonisation. And if you look at sort of the poorest parts of the planet, often are where cannabis uh, originated from in uh, Central Asia and, and through to Eastern Europe, um, some, v some very poor parts of, of the world who have an opportunity now in, in, through Africa. And we've seen the big companies shifting production very quickly into these third world uh, nations and what we want to do is try and make sure that uh, fair trade principles and practices standards are the baseline and what consumers expect from all of their cannabis products not just a sort of like with coffee or, or something it's a nice to have add-on it's like everybody expects this as the the foundation so moving quickly um, we've just yeah it's really only been the last couple of months we set up a little uh, website fair can uh, with two ends dot com uh, and we're keen for, for more partners to, to jump in with us and, and try and build this. And so it's great to be here and connecting with the SDGs. And um, I, you know, I do think that there's an opportunity for us to grab this industry before it's taken over by big tobacco, big alcohol and big pharma um, and ensure that some of those principles of, of worker cooperatives being uh, key to um, how the industry organises itself and, and the commercial structures that we put in place can actually ensure that the benefits accrue to uh, those communities, to the farmers, to the families, rather than just to the corporate shareholders. Um, so that's a, what we're involved in. Thank you very much for all those presentations. Maybe the, um, the first four could have a little reaction to how those those concrete businesses are happening. Ma Jonathan, do you have something to say? Yeah, how's the... Oh, down. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, well, I think I've got two things to say. One is to reiterate what other people said, and I think it, it shouldn't be forgotten that I think you're the first organization to realize how important th those uh, sustainable development goals are to how we deal with the, the developments of the industry. And I think the fact this conversation has started uh, here, I think could be significant if you're, if you're able to build on it. Uh, and I think the proof's in the pudding from, from I mean, the, the, the talk here about Morocco and actually the problems of the industry in Morocco with the water and the violence, which we see with other, with other cash crops around the world and the deforestation and all sorts of things happen when you have a cash crop. And we see activism still going on uh, and we see um, the law is always there uh, needing, needing uh, moving. But here, I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating. There are other models. There are other ways of doing it. And... I mean, I've often said the problem I have, it's a sad, it, I mean, I don't mean to, 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 to disrespect people from North America, but it's kind of sad that the Americans kind of decided they were going to change their mind and move forward with this. So we end up with a very sort of Americanized model and we end up with story after story of what happens in the States, which is a story after story... <laughs> It's a story after story of a person, uh, point of view, but it's a point of view of a country which right now has 
the sort of dominant power and the dominant voice. Uh, and I understand it comes through as individual stories, which are all worthy. But uh, it is one way of doing things, and there are other ways. And I think the more you can continue to talk, and the more we can hear things, and the more we can support and network between projects which are trying something else, the more chance you have of, of, of battling the, the bigger object. And that includes, you know, research pointing out where the industry... I mean, all this stuff of, well, let's never say anything bad about the industry because it's again, no, point it out. When they're doing something bad, point it out. Why not? We're people. That's what I got to say. And thank you for thank putting you this much. on. Thank you very much. Robert? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, I see things perhaps slightly differently. I think the United States, for example, is a good example of This is the first line of businesses trying to do things, and they're taking all of the bullets, so to speak, right? I don't suggest that the U.S. model is the leading model. It just is what it is. What I would suggest is that the policy model that is taking hold everywhere else around the U.S. is far closer to the Canadian model, and I call it the Canadian model because you understand what I mean, although it's not uniquely The Canadian model, it's based on UN premise of regulating cannabis and its uses individually versus having this sort of uh, meandering path. So I think that the United States is a good example of perhaps what not to do many times, but it's not the leader in policy. So when I talk about the U.S. or when anybody talks about the U.S., the lesson is not do what we do. The lesson is perhaps do part of what we do, but don't do these things because you've got so many people out there making mistakes and industries need to make mistakes. Everyone needs to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you don't learn anything. So the more mistakes we as Americans make, and we've made a few, maybe there was an election result a couple of years ago we'd take back. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, those are the things I think that, that, that matter. Now, I would also comment on a couple of other things. Um, you talk about creating a global cannabis community. That's why we're all here. I mean, I recognized this four years ago. I opened 10 offices outside of the U.S. for my law firm. Why? Because I wanted to take that company that was our client in Seattle, Washington, and connect him with a player in Greece and a player in New Zealand and a player in Poland What was the, and, and put them together global cannabis industry. How much more exciting does that get? It's real. It's real right now. And the connection of companies, as we've described here, that happens every single day. I get extremely excited when I'm able to take somebody uh, that I just meet from, from Spain, for example, and say, you should go talk to this person in Uruguay because there's a great trade relationship between these two countries and you're philosophically aligned and you should work together. That's the kind of thing that, that we do, but that's also something that's happening organically. So that's not a novel concept. It happens every single day and companies and people helping each other and not taking advantage of, of each other, believe it or not, is the norm even with publicly traded companies in the mix. They're responsible citizens. Why? Because they have to be, or else they're not going to interact with folks like us and company operators. So I don't think that's all bad. And then last, what I would say is, I pose that question. What happens when a movement becomes an industry? Boy, if we didn't get a lot of direction from this, this group of how to answer that question, because it's happening differently in different places, and that's what gets me excited. Continue the dialogue Build bridges, don't build distinctions. We're all the same. We just need to understand how to work together. Don't walk out of this room and go, I didn't like what that person said, and then you tear that bridge down. Find the one thing that you agree with and build that bridge, because guess what? The bridge gets bigger, and then who knows where that bridge goes. Alors, ta question était euh, que je sois bien sûr. Hmm? Ce que j'aimerais rajouter. Euh, alors, euh, en réaction à ce que tu viens de dire, 
global de, des circulations d'idées, de savoirs, de produits, etc., et notamment auprès des activistes et d'autres acteurs. Actors, but there's also some actors in the cannabis world who are absolutely not mobile and who are totally excluded from the international network. And I'm thinking of the farmers, uh, because we sort of took from them the, 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 the knowledge and their plans. And I think we should ask ourselves questions about what cannabis are we talking about? What is that plant nowadays? Uh, that plant uh, that is being used in very many different ways. Uh, the plant itself with the hybridization and the new farming methods uh, outside, inside. What are we exactly talking about? What are we defending? What are we standing up for? And let's think of those farmers who are excluded. Thank you. Um, nothing much to add uh, apart from um, I'm totally at the same line what they say. Um, at, at the end, uh, each country or each uh, model has its particularities. At the end, I believe that what we have to do is respect the particularities of the regulations that are taken on in each territory, learn of, of the best of each of them, learn the, the errors or the, the, the faults that they had, uh, and um, get together, the, the drug policy family is like big as the world, but small enough to get to know each other. Uh, at the end, and in Spanish, there's this, um, we say this like, divide y vencerás, uh, make a division and you will win. So what we have to do is get together, learn from each other, respect each other, and move forward uh, to make the people that regulate change their minds at the end is not who wins or who has the, the best, no? Respect the croppers, respect uh, the, the things that we do everywhere, get together and fight. Uh, I know that many people that you were there, yeah, there yesterday, uh, some people told me that uh, things changed because uh, social, uh, civil society were together and that made, made much more impact in politicians and regulators. So at the end, if the drug policy family gets on together, respecting each other and just learning from each other, uh, probably, I don't know if maybe in some years, but we, we will be speaking about uh, global cannabis regulation.